started. It looks like we've got uh, 35 people in attendance, so that's great, a great number, and uh, it looks like it's climbing away. So uh, let's go ahead and get started today. Welcome everybody to another installment of Lunch with a Curator. My name is Jeff Sellers, and I'm the Director of Education at the Tennessee State Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and hopefully you have your sandwich and you're now ready to sit back and learn and share some Tennessee history. That's what we're all about here at the Tennessee State Museum. Uh, so uh, we have a very appropriate topic for us today. And that topic is uh, all about food and when food becomes scarce. Uh, Thing that's right now in the news, right? Uh, so, uh, and, and when it does become scarce, how do we make do? So uh, before we get started, let's go over those all important housekeeping tips. Uh, first, uh, we're using a, a, the platform called WebEx. It's very much like Zoom. Many of you probably are familiar with Zoom. Uh, we're using WebEx, that's what the state uses. And we're not using a, a, a room for or a meeting format that you see all the kind of the Brady Bunch view. We're using more like a webinar format. So you won't necessarily see all of the people in attendance here right now, um, but rest assured there's lots of people still coming online. So we have a really good turnout today. Uh, so uh, there, there are lots of people here joining us. And since there are lots of people, we all know the very important and most important button is that mute button on your um, on your device or on your computer. You'll find the mute button. Uh, it is a small little microphone icon and it's down on the left hand part of your screen. Just scroll your mouse over that. Make sure your microphone is red and uh, the red microphone means you're muted. That way we won't get any barking dogs or anything like that. Uh, as we go through our program today or any other kind of feedback. Uh, but we do want your communication. We do want to hear from you. And we can do that through the chat bar feature. And that is that little text bubble down at the bottom right. If you click on that little icon, it will pop up a chat box screen there. Just type your, uh, type your question or comment into our panelists. And at the end of our program, we'll have a Q&A session where we will answer all your questions there. So um, uh, that's that's a great way to, to chat with us. We do have tech support. For some reason you can't hear or there's uh, you have speakers issue. First, make sure your speakers are on um, are not on mute. Uh, and then you can chat box us. Uh, we have Mamie and Rachel here as one of uh, the our tech support. So they'll be happy to help you there, okay? I think that about does it for our housekeeping tips. Now let's uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, very excited today to have our curator uh, featured, Mr. Rob DeHart. And Rob is a curator of history at the Tennessee State Museum. And uh, last year, Rob did a fabulous job curating an award-winning exhibit called Let's Eat, Origins and Evolution of Tennessee Food. Uh, and today he's going to bring us a talk entitled Making Do When Food Resources Are Scarce. Quite an appropriate topic. And to help him with this discussion, we're very pleased and excited to have a great friend to the museum, the noted food historian and scholar, Ms. Erin Byers Murray. She is the author of Grits, A Cultural and Culinary Journey Through the South. And uh, Rob, if you're ready, uh, we're ready to take it away and hand it over to you. All right, yes, I'm ready. So hello, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to my kitchen. I never thought I would say that to open up a museum program, but here we are. Uh, as Jeff said, we started thinking about this topic because I'm sure you recall when the COVID crisis first started and you went to the grocery store and about all the shelves were empty. I saw some memes going around how it was like an episode of Chopped where you were expected to make a meal out of just what you could find. So if you found just like hot dogs, asparagus and cotton candy, you were supposed to do something with that. And uh, knowing some of the people that I work with, I know some of them right now are going, hmm, that actually sounds pretty good. But, but we're here to talk about some other things, some ways that generations of Tennesseans have made do. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you now. And 
should be all seeing the presentation. Uh, a good example of what I'm talking about is right here, like chess pie. Chess pie has very few ingredients. It's very easy to make. And uh, to me, it's like pecan pie without the pecans. Uh, it's a, something that you could, um, okay. There, it's something that, um, um, that could be made with very limited resources and it's become a Southern staple. Um, so I'm really happy too, to have with me, Aaron Byers Murphy, Murray, as Jeff was talking about, um, she is an award-winning Nashville based food writer, author and editor at large at Nashville lifestyles. Uh, in addition to the book, she's going to talk about with us about grits. She's written three other books and is working on a fifth. So we're going to talk to her about that as well. Uh, but let it start first. I want to talk about process. Um, people uh, needed to be able to preserve food, to be able to make it through the winter months, because most people lived off stuff that they got in their gardens and fresh produce. So if you look at older cookbooks, you will see lots of time devoted to how to can, how to pickle different foods, because this was necessary for survival. So, um, for example, uh, the prevalent of canned mean, this is an advertisement from a national newspaper from 1856, where they are marketing a um, type of sealing, self-sealing can by promoting Christmas dinner. They're basically saying, if you want to have fresh food, fresh vegetables, fruits at Christmas, you're gonna to have to think about that now in September and be canning those. So it shows the prevalence of this. And if we look in the museum collection, we have quite a few things related to canning. Um, these two jars, the one on the left, it has the top that's probably most common to people. This was the jar uh, top that was patented by John Landis Mason. It's basically a zinc screw top and then a rubber ring that seals the jar. And uh, you see on the right, this is something we're real familiar with today, but when this jar was invented in, or patented, made in the early 1900s, it was called a lightning enclosure because you could very quickly just use that snap, that metal piece to snap the lid onto the jar. So there was a lot of innovations, a lot of uh, things going on with patents to try to find the best way to preserve foods. Uh, this, I was really happy to see that our social media team had put this on a quiz on our website. Um, and this is a can sealer. You would put a can underneath it or a bottle, press down the lever, and that would seal the can. Uh, and this is a really interesting artifact that we acquired not too long ago. It came from the Wessington Plantation that's in Robertson County. Wessington was the number one producer of tobacco in the U.S. And uh, by 1860, they had a very large enslaved workforce of about 274, about the largest in Tennessee. This is called a canning bench. Uh, through oral history, that's what this was used for for heating up food, getting it ready to can, and then laying it on this limestone slab to cool. It has a wooden base. Uh, there's a very good chance enslaved craftsmen made this, and it's for certain that it was enslaved laborers that used it. And then after the Civil War, uh, it would also have been used by African-American servants, which on the picture, there's four there who were enslaved at Westington, but then after emancipation, stayed and worked at the plantation. Uh, that's Allen, Emanuel, Granville, and Henny Washington. Now, as I said, there's a lot of cookbooks that would have things about canning. And um, this cookbook was written by a woman named Melinda Russell. It's the first cookbook published by an African-American woman. She was from Washington County, Tennessee. Um, and she published this in 1866, and she has a recipe for brandy peaches. And um, the, when we, in the exhibit, we made a series of tasty videos, which I'm gonna show you one because we did a tasty video for these peaches. It's really short, and it just shows you how this was made. 
And these are really fun videos to do. Um, our exhibit staff came up with the idea for this. And this recipe is on the event page on our website. So if you want to try this yourself, you can. Usually there would be music with it, but our music didn't, um, doesn't work with this way of broadcasting. But this gives me a chance to point out the wonderful hands of Naya Wallace. She's one of our staff members who is cutting up all these peaches and worked about an entire day on making this. Now to tell you, we made, I guess, six recipes and recorded them this way. And this was probably the best one. Some of them did not turn out so well, and I probably wouldn't have shared this way, but this one actually was pretty good. You can see laying out the peaches, and you can see there to the left the canning jars, because that's a big part of this process. And this is exactly how they would have done it 100 to years ago, using a funnel, putting boiling them to get rid of the bad bacteria, putting the syrup on them. And then she's putting the lids on them, just like we talked about. And then here's a perfect way to enjoy them. Some, some uh, sponge cake, some fresh peaches. You could be doing this in the middle of winter and some whipped cream. So shout out to Naya for doing that for us and for all the exhibits team that put that together. That was a really fun part of the exhibit. So next, uh, pickling. That's the other way that people preserve foods. Uh, that was by fermenting foods and uh, getting rid of the bad bacteria, but it would also promote the growth of good bacteria, which uh, was very good for digestion, still is. People see pickled things as very healthy. And what you realize when you look at the museum collection is how much people depended on ceramics for a lot of things that we're talking about, pickling especially, but really for any kind of food storage. This was the way they stored everything. And as a result, there were potters all across the state of Tennessee. This is an example of one from West Tennessee named William Craven. This jar is attributed to him. He came here from North Carolina in, by 1830, settled in Henderson County, which is, kind of close to Jackson, Tennessee. Um, and um, the, um, his father and his brothers came and a lot of these were family businesses um, with lots of people uh, or, or fairly large operations that would serve their community. We even have an example of a store ledger where the Cravens were paying for goods with their, um, with their pottery, with their pieces. A really good East Tennessee example is Charles Decker. And on the right, this is really a cool form. It's called a chicken waterer. It's made by Decker Pottery. This is another family-owned business that was in Washington County. Um, and Charles Decker was a German immigrant that eventually settled in Tennessee. They made all kinds of varieties of ceramics, even tombstones. Uh, this one is one we have in the collection that is inscribed with Charles Williams, born 1861 and died in 1881. We have a few things like that in our collection as well to show how prevalent it was. So now I want to shift gears just a little bit. and I want to talk about one of the greatest contributors to Southern food and in many ways the ultimate example of making do. Slave traders forced millions of African men, women, and children to leave their homelands and labor in the American South. And amid slavery's sorrows and horrors, enslaved people sought to maintain their ways of life the best way they could. And one of those ways was through food. In fact, um, uh, there's accounts of in people who were captured in Africa and brought here of hiding seeds in their hair so that they could um, somehow reproduce some taste of home when they got to wherever they were forced to go. Um, and in Africa, they had enjoyed a truly cosmopolitan um, cuisine. Um, they had a, a cuisine that favored hot, tart, and spicy. So they brought this to America, and so much of our Southern food is influenced by this. 
And especially it's remarkable because you have this group of people who had very limited resources who were forced to either forage or use whatever slaveholders provided them and make things that we uh, eventually find as, as such important parts of Southern cuisine. Uh, two examples that come to my mind immediately here is hot fish and hot chicken. I know hot chicken, that, that's the one on the right, is the star in Nashville. But um, according to one of the advisors on this exhibit, Alice Randall, hot fish is really more indicative of the African-American community in Nashville. Alice is a very um, important food author and also a Vanderbilt professor. Uh, fish hooks have been found at excavations of slave dwellings. And as you can imagine, it's like no matter what your economic circumstances, you might be able to find a way to find a stream, find a river and fish and catch a meal. So this was a very important protein for all kinds of people and people love the way that they were spiced up these dishes. Uh, another example is soul food. Uh, soul food, that term came about in during the American Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s as a way to describe food that was produced for African Americans by African Americans, take pride in it. What you see on the left um, are um, neck bones. Um, also in soul food, you'll find uh, chitlins things that uh, aren't normally found on other menus, but the way they're spiced, the way they're prepared, make them very popular. So I want to turn now, I'm trying to move a little bit fast because I want to make sure I have enough time for Aaron. Uh, let's talk about some natural occurring things. And this section that I'm going to talk about is a little bit bittersweet to me, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, first thing we think about are ramps. Ramps are similar to onions. They have a sweet garlic-like flavor and possess a signature potent odor. Uh, they only grow at certain elevations in wooded hills and they can be harvested in early spring. There's a lot of places in East Tennessee where these can be found and it's, it's a very seasonal thing. You, you cultivate them at, in May and you take them, you cook them, do them fresh. And it's bittersweet to me because there are so many ramp festivals in East Tennessee which I know at least the one that's in Polk County has been canceled this year, and I'm not sure about the other ones, but um, it may be that we have to wait for another year to, to go to some of these festivals. Uh, but this is something that, um, um, that East Tennesseans have enjoyed forever, and now lots of people from other places have learned about them and flocked to East Tennessee during ram season. Another thing I think about this time of year is strawberries. Uh, strawberries were a huge industry in Tennessee. We have three festivals, major festivals in the state, one in Humboldt, one in Portland, and one Dayton. Um, I do know that the Portland and Humboldt festivals have been canceled this year, but that shouldn't stop you from going to your local farmer, your local grocer, and uh, picking up some strawberries because this is like the best time to get them because they're going to be fresh and especially if you can find stands with local farmers uh, this is a, a great time to get these another thing i want to mention and i'm going to include a recipe with this one and it, it will also be on our event page are beaten biscuits uh, beaten biscuits are it's a very dense thick biscuit that was invented before baking soda was made widely available in the 1850s. The way they made the dough rise was to beat it until it blistered, created little air pockets, and then it would rise, but it was still a very dense biscuit. It's not what we think of today. I've only had them one time, and that's with ham. That's how you usually see them. It's more of an old Southern thing, but this is a beaten biscuit table that we have in our collection from the 1850s. And you can see it's pretty simple, just a limestone top. And then there's a beater, like a baseball bat, where you just beat the dough. And a little bit later, things got a little bit more sophisticated. This is a beaten biscuit table from the 1890s. You can see this, it's called a biscuit break. It's two rollers put together and you would put the dough through it multiple, multiple, multiple times until you could lay the dough out and then you could cut out the little biscuits. So here's kind of what they look like on the right. And this is a recipe that's adapted from 
the uh, Kentucky Housewife from 1885. This is on the event page, and you can see there's not a lot of, of ingredients here, and basically the big thing is just to beat them for about 45 to 90 minutes. So if you've got a lot of time on your hands and extra energy, frustrations, uh, you may want to take this on and see what you can do with beaten biscuits. If you've never had them, it, it would be like tasting something from 100 years ago. And the last thing I'm going to mention before I turn to Aaron is apple stack cake. We talked about this uh, a while ago when we did a program back in December 2018. So I have the recipe for this cake. This is another uh, tradition from East Tennessee that uses very minimal ingredients, but it's very labor intensive. So there are people that might remember their grandparents making this type of cake, but not a lot of people do it anymore. As you can see all the different layers and how those um, you spread this apple um, filling between them. Um, well, if, again, we're at a moment right now where we have um, a lot of time on our hands. So if you wanna try an East Tennessee tradition, if you go to our website and go to um, the stories page, which is where our blogs are, we did a blog on this type of cake back in December 2018, because it was around Christmas. And you'll find a whole recipe there that came from, um, that comes, it was uh, Fred Sossman who got me the recipe, but it's his wife's family's recipe. Um, Yes, Nevada Parker Dirting Stack Cake. I want to make sure I say the right thing. And she actually lived in Avid and, or, uh, Scott County, Virginia, but it's just like the cakes that were made here. So that is, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because I want to make sure we get a chance to talk to Erin. And um, I brought Erin on for this because she has devoted so much time and energy to talking about foods that are often very humble in origin. And I can't think of anything more humble than grits. That would definitely be in this presentation, but we have a first class author here to talk to us about her research on grits. So Erin, are you there? I'm here. How are you, Rob? Great, great. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for uh, having me. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you have the book sitting there because this is the point where I would hold the book right here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for doing it for me because my book is my office and I'm not allowed to go to my office. So there we go. And let me give the plug. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And uh, of course, the book is available at any of your favorite booksellers or through Kindle. Uh, it's really a fun read. So first, I want to ask you, Erin, uh, what did you learn in your research about the origins of grits? Well, um... It's, it's a lot, actually. <laughs> I went back pretty far. I, um, what I was looking for to begin with in the book was really what is the history of grits? Um, but that quickly took me down the rabbit hole of what is the history of corn? And so one of the things I uncovered or several things I uncovered, but, uh, you know, the corn itself um, was first cultivated back about nine or 10,000 years ago in the central Balsas uh, Valley in um, Mexico. And there's evidence of um, it first starting as a teosente, which is a plant. Um, and through the work of the agriculturalists at the time, they managed to, over probably a long period of time, they managed to um, adapt the corn or the, the grass uh, and, and grow it in different methods. And what they ended up with was the very first iterations of corn. And so corn from there, once they found a plant that had the cob that had edible, you know, kernels to it, um, which was very different than what we get now, but um, the, that, that plant was then cultivated and bred and there were, you know, they saved their seeds and they, year after year, they would play with different breeds basically and, and create and let this, this plant evolve. So the, um, you know, the work was probably done by a lot of women, um, but the seeds themselves were then carried hand to hand. Um, they eventually spread across the world, but in those early days, it was sort of carrying seed from one 
um, region to another and one maybe um, group cultural group to another so so over thousands of years this humble plant you know got spread really around the world and um, and it landed around in the southeastern United States around 2000 years ago so that's when we first start to see evidence of corn here in this region um, so so getting to the grits <laughs> um, I actually found that there were uh, in 87 8,700 BC in that same region of Mexico. So after corn had sort of been created, they discovered these hand stones and milling tools um, in a dig, an archaeological dig. And so there's evidence that people were, and it, and it had corn uh, or maize, um, traces of maize on it still. So there's evidence that people were milling or grinding corn at that early stage. And if they were grinding it, they were likely also combining it with water and putting it over heat um, to make a porridge. And so that, to me, <laughs> is probably our first uh, example of grits on 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 Earth. <laughs> um, at least that's those are the dots I like to connect because it makes you realize that you know everything goes back much further than you think it does. And when you when you get into food research you really start to uncover all these connections and, and um, cultural interests that align in ways that you might not have ever expected. So. Yeah, I've, um, I, I know there's some accounts with Southeastern India and some of those cultures that our curator, Debbie Shaw, has talked about where there's examples, same, same sort of thing, archaeological examples, and then oral traditions passed down, like using um, bear oil and different things with, with grits. Mm -hmm. um, so where does your research, you start to pick up our Southern infatuation with grits? <laughs> well, it's interesting because the stories of grits really, it doesn't, it doesn't get recorded. It doesn't actually get stamped into a, a place of record um, in writing. It, orally, it had been recorded before that, but um, it was when colonists arrived on the shores of Virginia and um, there are these accounts of the Native Americans handing over, you know, bowls of steaming maize, um, and the the settlers, you know, accepted it, ate it. They were grateful, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> then they called it what their language would have, you know, applied to it, which they called it. Um, it was greets, basically, G R Y T T S, um, and then it that pronunciation sort of got um, shifted and changed and it became grits from that point on. So that that was that happened in Virginia. Um, and it really that dish itself was made everywhere. It ha it's it is still made everywhere. It's made across cultures all over the world, um, a corn porridge. Um, but the reason I think it really cemented in the South um, is going back to that conversation you were having about enslaved communities because they were, as you said, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, forced to forage or to only use what was given to them. And so um, corn and meal were big parts of that um, exchange. And they could also, if, if they were able to, they were allowed to, they would um, grow corn in their, in their gardens. So it was, it was a food that could be easily, you know, come, it could easily come about. So um, and you would find evidence of grits being made both in enslaved kitchens and in the big house kitchens by enslaved cooks. So that, and it was a dish that was sustaining, it was filling, you know, it provided good nutrients. Um, so all parts of the culture and community could partake in it. And, and that was, I think, because the population of enslaved people was so large in this part of the country, it became a dish that um, was, it became prevalent throughout this entire region. Yeah, that's, that's something I think I forgot to mention too, is like we talked about enslaved African-Americans, but then after the war, so many African-Americans worked as domestic cooks and in restaurants. And that's another way that so many of these dishes become Southern staples, um, mm -hmm. even, even after the war. Yeah. Um, so, um, so why do you think uh, grits, you kind of alluded to this, but why are they so beneficial, you think, in times of scarcity? Here we are right now. And, uh, yeah. 
Um, well, I think the the grits, especially, it's a, a bulk product that you can um, buy with very, you know, very little money and you can um, make it stretch and make it go a long way. So, so whether it's cooking a big pot in the morning and having some for breakfast and then applying it to dinner, um, you know, that hot fish would be great over a pile of grits. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was, a, it's also something that you can not preserve, but you can hold on to and ration for coming days. So if you, you have a refrigerator, you can do so many other things with grits after they've been made the first time. So you can really have that as a part of a meal, you know, for multiple meals. Um, so, and it's, you know, like we do fried grits. That's our, you know, like that's our way of, you know, making, we have a big pot and we have extras. We always turn them into fried grits afterwards. So we have like a, something to snack on for dinner, so. Yeah, I, I was, one of the things about the South I noticed, I, I have to admit, I'm not originally from the South, but I've been here a long time now. So I, I feel, feel that way, but how it's eaten for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. It's, it's like one of those foods that, uh, you could go to breakfast, there's cheese grits. You could be something uh, something with your entree at lunch or dinner. So it is, it can just be used for anything. Yeah. And they, you know, it, it is. And um, they, you know, in our, you know, the way I look at it is that's, you know, it's nutritional too. It's got, you know, if you're not, you obviously people do load it up with butter and <laughs> some people put sugar in their grits, but if you eat it as it is and you just add like a little salt and water, you're, it's so much good protein and, um, and there's just a lot of nutritional value to it as well. So. How do you see uh, the links with grits and Southern identity? I mean, uh, you know, we, we can talk about the food part of it, but it's sustenance, but there's more to it than that, isn't there, really? Well, I think that, you know, for so, uh, I think when it comes to, you know, especially dishes like this that are these iconic Southern dishes, you know, they're, they're more than just, it's a memory. It's a memory of childhood. It's a memory of who cooked them for you at one point in time. It's, you know, they, and that's not just grits. That's so many, you know, iconic Southern staples, but, um, but they're also, um, you know, I think that Southerners, uh, you know, I, I think there's this sense of like, we, we, you know, are, we are hard workers, we're salt of the earth, you know, and I think there's some of that, that comes with a dish like this, that, you know, it just makes you feel grounded um, and uh, connected to your region. So uh, I, that might be not the answer you were looking for. <laughs> no, that, that totally makes sense. I think the memory, it's the same with the apple stack cake. I remember when we talked about that a uh, year, over a year ago, how many people just had these memories and and it was very regional, you know, it was more East Tennessee. And there were some people in East Tennessee, friends of mine, that were like, I've never even heard of that. You know, it's it's very interesting. But but then to some, it was like, wow, this, you know, I kind of forgotten. This was every holiday. This would be here. And I have memories about dehydrating our apples and or rehydrating, sorry, mm -hmm. they're opposite. Um, so yeah, I, I could see how those memories come back. Um, I, you know, so across my research, I talked to so many people, um, and I still do. I talk, I have conversations about grits all the time because whenever people, it, it triggers such a, a nostalgia for people, you know, like that was something, it was on our table every morning. And, you know, if, it, if we didn't have grits, the sun wasn't shining and it was just, you know, there was all this, um, connection to it. So it's, it, and I think that. You know, I think those memories are it, when it comes to food, it's such a good channel to sort of bring people together or to to identify what those, um, you know, what those cultural touchstones are for us. Yeah, I, I have a weird one. I'll see if you've ever heard of it. Have you ever heard of Geta? No. What's that? That's, a, that's <laughs> a Cincinnati it? thing. Oh, it's, no. it's 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 cut... it... so, go ahead, go ahead. It's it's cut oats and it's oh. it's fried up in a patty. And they, mm -hmm. they even have a Geta festival in Cincinnati, and I really never liked it very much, so I don't really miss it. But that was something you still, you go to breakfast bars in Cincinnati, you will see Geta there. It's will just, you sell that for me? No, <laughs> I'll have to send it to you because I, I can't remember. And I always thought it was a German thing because German is, culture is such a big part of Cincinnati. But somebody told me, no, it was just, just I, I, I don't know. I can't remember the exact history, but it's just cut oats. But anyway, 
Um, so I'm, that's my next research project. Okay, please write a book on Geta. <laughs> yeah, I would like that. For everyone out there. Um, okay, a couple more things. Uh, you mentioned fried grits, and yeah. you were very nice to share your fried grits recipe with us, which is going to be posted on the event website. In fact, I think it already is. Could you talk a little bit about that recipe and oh, how yeah. that evolved? Well, I mean, I think a lot of it's been, you know, it's been a good use of um, extra grits for as long as there have been grits, I'm sure. But it's just so simple because, and if you think about it, really grits, it's just water and and um, the, the milled corn. So that's, you know, that's all you need for that. And then you, for this, the actual fried grits, you just, um, dust them with a little flour um, and then you fry them either in butter or oil. So it's, you know, so easy, so simple. You have the ingredients in your house already um, and they'll last for a couple days, like once you fry them up and and they're just, they're good with everything. So that Sounds great. I, I uh, imagine a lot of people are going to try that after this. I hope so. Uh, um, I have one more question and I think we'll open it up to everybody else. Um, you have shown how grits had such humble origins, but now you can see international chefs are like making dishes with grits. So yeah. give give us an example or two of that. I mean, I just I, I where you've seen grits on some fancy five star restaurant for you know lots of yeah. money. Well, um, one of my favorite stories that uh, I researched and learned about was um, the arrival of shrimp and grits on menus, um, on restaurant menus, because it, before that, grits served with shrimp. Um, usually the shrimp were just tossed in a little bit of butter, and it was usually a breakfast dish that um, a lot of people in the low country would eat um, because they were creek shrimp that were easy to catch. And so they could put the shrimp right on the, the grits, and that was a breakfast dish. But um, in the 1980s, um, a chef named Bill Neal started to, um, he, he actually put, he was, an article was being written about him by a reporter from the New York Times named, named Craig Claiborne. And in the article, he gave a recipe for shrimp and grits. And it was a variation of his that, you know, actually was way more um, complex. It had mushrooms and bacon and some other, you know, tomatoes, I think, were in his. But um, that dish ended up on his menu, restaurant menu. And he had a restaurant in Chapel Hill. And um, and so you then from there, it sort of exploded, like the dish shrimp and grits became a thing that people on, you know, in restaurants around the country sort of wanted to emulate and they were taking different variations on it. And that still happens. You see shrimp and grits on a lot of high end restaurant menus um, in totally different formats. But um, but but then, you know, you look at the influences of, of Southern chefs and, and on, of Southern cooking and you know, that those restaurants that are now elevating certain dishes, like, you know, they'll put shrimp and grits or they'll put collards on their, their menu there. It's, it's sort of taking it to a whole new level. But um, I, I also really love there's um, at Highlands Bar and Grill, which is down in Birmingham, Alabama, and will hopefully reopen soon, um, does a dish called um, stone ground baked grits. And it's like a souffle that is with tempered eggs and there's um, butter, sherry vinegar, mushrooms, um, and some some ham, but it is like the most decadent, <laughs> stunning dish. Um, and I, I, I want to go with it's not under 20 or just under $20. I wanna say. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, but that dish uh, helped sort of set a new tone for Southern food in a lot of ways, you know, just like the shrimp and grits did. I think it Basically, chefs took that as a platform to help elevate our our food ways and to say like these are really important dishes, um, so you should be paying attention to them, and we're going to give them more attention because you know. And I think it's been so fascinating to watch, especially the last couple of years, the last ten to fifteen years, how chefs have taken and run with the southern um, food ways, uh, you know steam engine. <laughs> it's like they just, they are passing all over the, around the country. You're finding it around the world now. Um, you can find hot chicken in Australia. It's like, yeah. you know, um, so it's been really cool to see our food get, you know, get some attention. Granted, it's way more expensive than most of us are, <laughs> are able to pay for regularly, but at least it's putting them on a, more, on a, a larger platform. Yeah, I think it's awesome. I think it's well-deserved. Um, okay, well, let's look at what questions we have. Jeff, can I turn it back to you and 
and see what uh, people have been asking on the chat. Oh yeah, yeah, we got some great, great, uh, great questions coming in. Of course, uh, you know, there's several of them that Aaron, they all want to know what is your favorite way to eat grits? Um, and our house is a, it's mostly for breakfast, I have to say. It's like breakfast with some scrambled eggs and some really good sausage on the side. Um, but I also make a couple dishes at dinner time that uh, we that's like they're like pure comfort. But one of them is a it's basically grits with Gruyere cheese, and then you top it with sautéed mushrooms that have been you know doused with a little um, vermouth. So it's just rich. Mm warm and it's like the most wonderful warming winter dish and it's vegetarian which it also is you know i i like to mix things up and go veggie every now and then so <laughs> um that's great yeah you know uh, rob you'll recall uh we had this um you know there are endless number of debates in food uh uh the 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 cornbread should it be sweet or unsweet was the was the great debate for our last exhibit and of course, the sweet versus unsweet grits is another huge um, debate. Where do you fall on that, Erin? <laughs> in terms of grits? Yeah, um, grits, sweet or unsweet? Well, it's every, I mean, I personally don't put a lot of sugar in my grits. <laughs> I have one great, awesome way to do it, which is like so crazy, but it's you put a sorghum butter on top of hot grits. And that's the way I put like any kind of sweetener in my grits, but um, otherwise, no, I'm a savory, savory grits person personally. <laughs> okay, great. This might be for you, Rob or Aaron. Um, well, we did have a question. What what specific spices um, did come out of Africa? Um, did, did, did that come up in your exhibit, Rob? Um, yes, yeah, some. Um, the big what we focused on were the peppers, the hot peppers, which the varieties from Africa did not grow here, but they there were other varieties like the Magneta, I think it's called pepper. Um, so so basically, when an Africans came here, they adopted the type of peppers that were growing here and infused them in the dishes that they were making. Those, those are the that's the major thing that we talked about. Awesome, awesome. Um, and this is a this is I'm going to try to roll a bunch of questions here and and uh, into into kind of one. But it really looks at how we you know our current status right now and food has always kind of been a comfort um, a comfort to us in times of scary situations. Sometimes it's just a comfort for us in general. Um, so what are the ways you all are seeing or that maybe you're using with your family? Uh, to use food to kind of comfort the situation um, that we're all in. Um, we've heard lots about victory gardens and, you know, canning and things kind of going back to the old past ways. What are some of the things that you could recommend to us um, uh, to use in this special time to help comfort us? Well, I'll answer <laughs> in my own personal way. Um, we just getting the kids to cook with me uh, and, and cook together as a group, um, whether it's just making sandwiches at lunchtime or you know, we're eating every meal together every day now, which is, is great. And it's just an opportunity for me to share um, little things with them, you know, so but then also, uh, you know, I've, I've been working on my um, my sourdough bread making because <laughs> it takes it's such a it's such a great time consuming project and I have I take a lot of joy in baking um, bread. <laughs> I'm not really a good sweets baker, but uh, yeah, and I think just rediscovering that that interest, uh, you know, that that was probably festering away for a long time that I couldn't, um, you know, couldn't have never had time to do. Uh, but now I have the time. And, and so that's what we've been spending a lot of time doing. Uh, yeah, this is the year of sourdough. My <laughs> my my youngest has been doing that too. And um, and what I've enjoyed, my kids are older than yours. They're getting ready to get out of high school, getting ready out of college, but they're both here now. And I love how we have been alternating cooking dinner. And and it's just it's such a relief for me and my wife just to have someone else doing it. And then it is, it's like a shared thing. You know, you're tasting each other's food and it's uh, it's it's it, it's been a great activity. I'm really proud of my my kids for wanting to take that on. 
How are, how are their creations? Are they are you actually ready? really good? I they uh, my daughter spent some time in Germany and she made uh, currywurst. That was it last night. Yeah, she like it was great. And um, my other one did uh, ribs on the grill. I, I like like spent the whole day doing it, and they turned out great. So yeah, they've been doing better than me actually. <laughs> What kind of food traditions of the past do you think we have now have an opportunity to really focus in on and carry it in our own way uh, into our own generation? Uh, uh, you know, thinking, uh, Rob, you started talking about canning and uh, things like that. What, what are some of those things that you hope uh, the food we can now look back on in light of our new world uh, and uh, maybe um, take advantage of some of those um, some of those lessons from the past? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, I agree with the canning um, uh, just because I remember my parents doing it and I've never done it. And I think back like I wish wish we did it more, wish my uh, my dad used to make pickles, too. I mean, he used to make all kinds of things and they would we could always get them out during um, the winter months. Uh, so I, I think that would be nice if people started thinking that way more towards preserving their own foods or, or uh, you know, just a better alternative and some of the more the salt infested things that not infested, but infused things we find in grocery. <laughs> okay, I'll give it to you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I also think, I mean, for me, one of the things I was playing with earlier this year was fermentation. And um, so fermenting, you know, anything really, any vegetables or pickles or um, we did a sauerkraut that is, you know, it's so good that you know, I think that's something that more and more people are exploring too when it comes to, um, you know, how to combat food waste because you can really do a lot with fermented foods rather than let it go, you know, and get spoiled. So, and it, it obviously holds for a long time. So, um, so yeah, I hope that we do some more exploration of fermentation and, and that more people give it a try. Yeah. Awesome. Aaron, this last one is for you and then we'll, we'll sort of wrap it up today, but, uh, uh, Lee asks, um, what is the biggest difference between polenta and grits? What is the origin of polenta? Uh, it, they seem so similar to grits. <laughs> they are. They're very close cousins. <laughs> um, there are the major differences. Um, there, are really, there are two, really, but uh, grits and polenta come from two different types of corn, two different species. So there's a hard dent corn, um, and then there is a softer flint corn, and the grits are usually made from a dent corn. Um, polenta is usually made from a flint corn, and um, it also comes down to, although that was, you know, traditionally how that was done, but now you, you might find something labeled polenta that comes from a, a corn similar to what you find from grits. Um, the other major difference was in the way that it was milled. So the corn and this was, I thank the Italians for their uh, refining processes, but they um, basically had a, a, a system of milling corn that was different. So with grits, you mill the corn one time and then you sort of um, filter it. So you've got, um, you grate it. So you've got the top is the kind of the, the big bits of the grits. Um, if you shake it out, you'll get um, corn meal and then you'll get corn flour kind of um, grating it out like that. The Italians, and well, I don't know if they invented this, but they started using it with their corn to um, what they do is um, gradation milling. So they actually mill the corn once, then they'll put it through again and again and again until they get a super fine product through the milling process versus through uh, the gradation process. So, so the uh, those are the kind of the big differences. But again, they're they're cousins. Um, I think that you know there used to be some um, high, highly uh, regarded guidelines to polenta. They still exist out there, but um, I think nowadays you find polenta made in all kinds of different formats and ways. So um, I'm not sure that you know it all still applies, but that was the original differentiation. Okay. Wow. And if you want to know more. Uh, get the book, right? <laughs> get the book. Uh, yeah, I just want to let everyone know again. Uh, it's the, uh, the book is Grits, A Cultural and Culinary Journey Through the South. Uh, Rob and Aaron, that, that's, uh, it's been such a great conversation. I've enjoyed it. I don't know if anyone else has, but I, I know that we all have. 
uh, I've enjoyed uh, eating my lunch. Uh, just feel like I'm I'm kind of uh, sitting along, uh, listening to a great conversation going along. It's been a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Uh, that's where we'll kind of uh, uh, leave our talk today. But thank you guys so much. Thanks for having. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. For uh, for those uh, that, that have joined us, we want to say thank you so much for joining us today. We've had over 50 people on the call with us today on this talk. Uh, and I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. Again, we're going to meet right here every week. Uh, and, and you do not want to miss next week. Let me go ahead and plug that real quick. Our next curator is going to be our curator uh, of, uh, of, um, of fine arts. And that is Annabeth Hayes. And uh, she is um, going to speak on her current research on the life of Elizabeth Ralston. And this is Tennessee's first female printer. Her blog post is on the website right now. Go visit tnmuseum.org and go to the Stories tab, and you'll see her new blog post. It's called Pressing Forward, The Life of Elizabeth Ralston, Tennessee State Printer. And uh, I, I can't tell you, I'm very excited about this one. So join us for that. Read that blog post. Think about some good questions. Join us right back here. So um, on behalf of the Tennessee State Museum staff, I want to say thank you all again for joining us. Thank you for your support. Uh, take care of each other during this time. And uh, we'll meet right back here next week for some great Tennessee history. Have a great rest of your day. We'll sign off from here. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you to Rachel and Mamie. I forgot to say that. Thank you, Rachel and Mamie, for your tech support. Bye, guys. <laughs>